Okay, so now we are going to talk about the auditory system. Now, there's dysregulation of the auditory system, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the bones. We're going to talk about uh, basically the pieces and parts. We're going to talk about dysregulation and dysfunction. We're going to talk about patient presentation. That's important because patient presentation is pretty much going to let us know what's going on with the ears before I even look in them. So, for instance, if they tell me, hey, I came in because something's going on with my ear, it's been hurting worse and worse the last couple of days, really, really bad when I first wake up in the morning, really, really bad in the middle of the night, and then as I was in the shower, I felt this blood-curdling pain, I screamed as top as I could, and then things started, like, escaping out of my ear, and then it was nothing but pure relief. So I know that that's a perforation, right, period. So it's the presentation of the patient. It's the presentation of the subjective data. It's the presentation of the physical ear when I look at it. So I, I need for you to know um, what's the presentation. What does it look like? Uh, what is, has happened to them? Like what's the disease process? I need for you to know what's the management for it. When we're dealing with ears, we don't like to put a lot of things in ears. We also don't like to give a lot of meds for ears, right? Because of in my generation, when I was a kid, I had chronic ear infections, right? So then I ate the pink stuff. And to me, it tasted like roses. But everybody who is my age knows the pink stuff that I'm talking about. It was always in the fridge. It tasted really good like candy, right? Because that's how they got everyone to do it. The problem with that was is we accumulated so much of it. And when it became crystallized, we just throw it in the sink. Well, that became the problem with superbugs, right? That and about 15 other things. So uh, the the deal with this is, is we need to make sure that we try to prevent it. So the management on this is very bizarre. This is like old school ancient medicine, right? And it, old school ancient concepts that still work today that we prefer to use before we start, you know, doing interventional medicine. So let's get into all of those bits and bobs, pieces and parts, whatever you want to call them. And I'm going to hold this baby who has an ear infection right now. So she's going to be whimpering in and out. And I apologize. You guys know I don't edit. I just roll through because we got a lot of stuff to do and we got a lot of catching up to do. So bear with me. I love you. I'm proud of you guys. It's going to be okay. Remember, I talk from a health assessment level all the way up to a doctorate, advanced practice, nurse level all the way up sometimes to a med school or a medical doctor level because I like to study everything because I'm a nerd. So let's do it. Let's do it. You're going to do fine, guys. Let's do it. Just relax, kick back. It's going to be okay. Now, as we move along, if you have an opportunity to come back and look at this, there's also one in your book, obviously. I'm not sure what page is on because we have different books. Apparently, I just found this out on Friday. Um, so find your diagram that looks like this. I, I wish I knew what page. Um, if you just go in the back of your book and check the glossary and just put uh, or search out, you know, um, ear structures or ear anatomy, that should be good enough. And then I'm just going to go ahead and keep rolling and talk about uh, the middle ear, the inner ear, and um, the external ear anatomy. So Structures and functions of the auditory system, you get, again, the external, middle, and inner ear. Um, we're talking about the functionality of it is specifically hearing and balance. Um, the central auditory system is cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear, um, and it is uh, attached to the auditory cortex of the brain. Um, again, it transmits and processes sound and uh, creates equilibrium within the body or destroys equilibrium depending on if we have a dysfunction of that area. Okay, so the external ear is comprised of the auricle or what they call the pinna. Um, the external auditory canal, uh, which is separated from the middle ear and uh, by a dislike structure called the tympanic membrane, which you know is the eardrum. The ears are located obviously on either side. Sometimes when the ears are lower set than the eye level, which is where they're supposed to sit, um, that is a precursor or an indicator for having a specific cognitive delay, which we will talk about later. Um, that's, I think when we get into neuro, that's when that'll come up. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh yeah, the oracle is attached to the side of the head by the skin. Um, it's mainly cartilage except for the fat and the subcutaneous tissue and the earlobe. Uh, let's see what else. 
Uh, the Oracle. Uh, so it aids in collection of sound waves and their passage into the auditory canal. Um, just anterior or just in front of that to the external auditory meatus is the temporomandibular joint or what they call the TMJ. Um, the head of the mandible can be felt by placing a fingertip in the external auditory meatus while opening and closing your mouth. You'll feel a lock or a pop out and then back in again. Um, the external auditory canal is approximately eh, two and a half, three centimeters in length. Um, the lateral third of it is elastic um, cartilage and dense fibrous framework um, to where the thin skin is attached. Uh, the external auditory canal, let's see what else, uh, ends at the tympanic membrane. Um, the skin of the canal contains specialized glands, uh, ceruminous glands. Uh, which have a secretion of a brown wax-like substance called cerumen or earwax. Um, what else can I tell you? Let's see. Uh, the ear has a self-cleaning mechanism that moves old skin cells uh, to the outer part of the ear. So throwing Q-tips in it is a terrible idea because all it does is stop that shift of your body doing what it's supposed to do. Um, plus, it plugs things up. It, it helps with tympanic membrane, effusions. It, it's a big fat mess. So no Q-tips. Q-tips, bad. Q-tips, ear, terrible. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, this rumen, it has um, also an antibacterial property that serves as a protectant for skin. So keep those things in mind when you're thinking about that because, you know, we do go back to a lot of issues with the external auditory canal, specifically with uh, the tip of the mandibular joint whenever you have um, a dislocated TMJ. All right, so the middle ear is, it comprises of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Um, laterally and the uh, otic or otic capsule uh, medially, the middle um, ear cleft lines between the two. Um, the tympanic membrane lies at the end of the external auditory canal and marks the lateral limits of the middle ear. Um, basically, it just says they're all aligned. That's all that means. Uh, the membrane is about a centimeter in diameter, very thin. Um, it's normally pearly gray in color and translucent. Sorry, my baby is coughing over milk. Um, the middle ear is an air-filled cavity that houses the um, ossicles or uh, the middle ear bones and is connected by the eustachian tube and the nasopharynx. Um, it's also uh, continuous with some air-filled cells in the adjacent mastoid portion of the temporal bone, um, which is another cavity or area of, of cavity. Um, the middle ear contains the three smallest bones or the ossicles of the body. That's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Um, Let's see, what else is there? There's two fenestrae or oval round windows in the medial wall of the middle ear, which separates the middle ear from the inner ear. Uh, there's a foot plate um, of the stapes that sits, um, that sits in the oval window where sound is transmitted to the inner ear. Uh, the round window provides an exit for sound vibration, so um, you process that uh, through your cochlear nerve 8 again. Um, the round window is covered with a very thin membrane, and the sapes foot plate is secured by another um, tenuous, uh, tenuous annulus or a ring-shaped structure. structure. Um, both the round window membrane and the oval window um, are susceptible to rupture, which is when we talk about uh, perforations. When, when that happens, um, fluid from the inner ear can leak into the middle ear. And again, that's called a, a, a paralymph fistula. Uh, the eustachian tube is about a millimeter wide, about 30 millimeters long. Um, it connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. Um, normally, the eustachian tube is closed but it opens by the action of the palate muscles uh, when performing like a valsalva maneuver or what they call vagaling down or by yawning or swallowing, which is why you hear this pop, pop, pops whenever you do that. Um, the tube serves, serves as drainage um, in a channel for normal and abnormal secretions of the middle ear, and it equalizes the pressure in the middle ear um, with that of the atmosphere. And this is where we get into issues with balance if that, if that pressure is off. Um, I always talk about the, the atmospheric pressure, and when it gets a little too high or a little too low, that's when you usually have that default and that feeling of dizziness, um, that feeling of, uh, you know, vertigo, that feeling of walking sideways, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the inner ear is housed deep within uh, the petraeus portion of the temporal bone. Um, the organs for hearing are the cochlea, um, and that deals with, you know, uh, the semicircular canals that work with balance, as well as cranial nerve 7, which is a facial nerve, cranial nerve 8, which is vestibular cochlear. They're all part of the complex anatomy. Um, the cochlear and the semicircular canals together um, constitute the bony labyrinth. And the three semicircular canals, posterior, superior, and lateral, lie about 90 degrees to one another and contain um, sensory receptor organs related to equilibrium. So this is where we have the dysfunction when we do have that vertigo. Um, these receptor end organs are stimulated by changes in the rate or direction of an individual's movement. So it's a, it's a quick change. She said it's a quick change as well. So there you go. Um, the cochlea is like a snail shape. Uh, it's a bony tube. Um, it has about two and a half spiral turns and contains the end organ for hearing. Um, it's called the organ of corti, FYI. Within the, um, within the labyrinth, uh, it, it is not completely filling it. It lies um, within the membranous labyrinth, so keep that in mind. Um, the membranous labyrinth is bathed uh, in a fluid called uh, perilymph, which communicates directly with the cerebral spinal fluid of the brain via the cochlear aqueduct. So the membrane labyrinth comprises of the uh, urticle, um, the saccule, the semicircle canals, the cochlear duct, and the organ of corti. I think that's, yeah, I think that's everything. Um, the membranous labyrinth holds uh, fluid, called the endolymph. Um, there is a delicate balance of the perilymph and the endolymph in the inner ear. Many um, inner ear disorders occur where the balance is disrupted. Um, you have something like angular acceleration, which results in the movement in the inner ear fluids in the canals and stimulates the hair cells of the membranous labyrinth. Um, this results in electrical activity that travels along the vestibular cochlear division of cranial nerve 8 to the brain. Um, a change in head position, a linear acceleration, stimulates the hair cells to the uricle. Um, it also results in electrical activity being transmitted to the brain by cranial nerve 8. Um, in the internal auditory canal, or the cochlear acoustic nerve, arises from the cochlear and it joins the vestibular nerve and arises from the semicircular canals, the urticle, um, the saccule, to become the vestibular cochlear nerve itself. Um, joining the nerve in the internal auditory canal is the facial nerve, and the internal auditory canal takes these nerves and their blood supply to the brainstem to send signals and messages around. Now, do I expect you to know all of this? No, that's crazy. But I want you to understand the anatomy behind this because it will come back later, and when you hear these weird words like organ of corti, you will have an idea of at least where it belongs. <laughs> so you'll know, oh yeah, that's right, Molly was jibber-jabbering off about that, and it's in the inner ear somewhere. All right, cool, I can go from there. And my kid's laughing because she gets it. All right, so next slide. So we talked about the three semicircular canals in the vestibule. We talked about the nerve impulses, and they're generated from the movement. We talked about the pieces and parts that have everything that joins together to send that electrical conductive message um, to the brain stem so that it can then transmit up to the circle of wills, be transmitted, and then um, you are able to hear. Okay, so here's where it gets a little bizarre. Um, the sound waves in the air are picked up by the oracles in the auditory canal to the tympanic membrane, okay? Um, vibrations are different than the sound waves, obviously. So we're talking about tympa mandibular demalius to incus to sapies. That's a lot, I understand. Um, to move into the oval window to waves to perilymph to cochlea. So there's, there's a lot of this and that and the others um, when we're talking about vibrations specifically. Um, the cochlea initiates nerve impulses to cranial nerve 8, which is vestibular cochlear, which I always talk about because I love it, love it, love it, because this is what is going to dictate um, how we are going to assess our patient and whether we need a recommendation, a referral to neurology um, while we're inpatient or if we need one uh, referred over for specialty appointment if we're doing primary care. Um, the bones of the skull can transmit sound directly to the inner ear through bone conduction. Um, and this is why you will hear about people who are 100% deaf, but they can still dance to music because the vibrational pattern is still being transmitted through the bones of the skull and still can get directly into the inner ear. You just can't hear the, the sound wave itself um, through the air conduction. Yes.
Thank you. What she just said was uh, presbycusis, hearing loss due to aging. Uh, tinnitus is ringing in the ears. We talked about that. Um, if you recall tinnitus, the ringing of the ears, um, a medication will cause this through ototoxicity, and that would be your Lasix that we've discussed. Um, reduced transmission of sound is atrophy of the cerumen glands or dry earwax that's causing this. Um, your balance is uh, affected by any atrophy of vestibular structures, slow motor responses, and musculoskeletal limitations. Um, I think that's all I have for this slide. Remember how I told you to look all the key terms up for this section? Be familiar with those things. Um, these these uh, presbycusis, the tinnitus, the um, the strabismus and diplopia that we have with the eyes. Those are going to be terms that might come back to bite you later on. Um, there's one that will bite us for our exam, if I'm not mistaken. But don't worry about it. Like I said, just I want you to focus on just rolling over those key terms so that you understand. Hey, this one's eye, this one's ear, and that should should be enough to get you where you need to go for the exam. Okay, so when we're talking about vestibular balance, vertigo, um, this is when the person or objects are moving or spinning, and it's stimulated by head movement. So any movement whatsoever is a bad day for them. Um, nystagmus is another side indicator that you have a true vertigo because you're going to have abnormal like doll-like movements or blurred vision within your eyes and there's a test for that and we'll talk about it in a little bit especially when we get into neuro and our neuro assessment to test for those things so subjective data Subjective data can also be objective data in some instances, and that's when we're going back and looking at um, childhood propensity. So we do our history, and we might hear that a person has, you know, one or two um, incidences of ear infection as a kid, or we can hear that, you know, it's, it happened essentially monthly or bi-monthly. It would be just a, a massive problem. But we have care everywhere with an ethic, so we can actually check you know, as far as 15 years I've been able to do before. So we can actually see these appointments and see what's happened or seeing what the end result is or looked at the medications that they've taken. So it's subjective because we get the information from the patient, which might yield some type of variance, but it's also objective because we also have it in their H&P. Um, systemic conditions, head injuries, allergies, current symptoms, family history, all of these are subjective because again, it's not an end all be all lab value or definitive um, from a physical assessment. Okay, so functional health patterns, look at your table on 21-2. That is going to um, kind of give you a little synopsis of um, the auditory system, the functionality, um, any health history that you need to get, um, health perceptions, health management patterns, it's all in your textbook. Um, when it comes to gradual versus sudden hearing loss, Sudden hearing loss is never a good thing. So you can perforate an eardrum with sudden hearing loss. You can wake up one morning and that tumor that you have in your head is just gotten big enough to make you completely deaf on one side um, or have bilateral um, hearing loss if, if that's the case. An M16 can perf your eardrum if it's loud enough and you've popped it that many times. Um, so there are different uh, types of preventative measures like, hey dummy, if you're gonna shoot an M16, wear your hearing protection. Little simple things like that. You'd be surprised at how much easier it is to not perf something on the inside of your ear when you have uh, proper protection against hearing loss. Okay, so this slide basically says when you're dealing with the auditory system, a lot of things can throw it off. So um, one of the things is ear pain with chewing or swallowing. Um, this can be a couple of things. It's usually an indicator um, for an inner ear infection. Um, alcohol, uh, sodium, dietary supplements, uh, these things can also change the fluidity in your body. Sodium specifically is directly tied with Meniere's disease. So if they have exacerbation of their Meniere's, they need to back off the sodium. Oh, by the way, I believe we might have talked about that in review. 
so there's that. Um, dentition, we also, oops, we also have um, straining issues. So when you strain, you increase the pressure in your ears, which means they're going to pop. Um, they're going to sometimes sound like there is someone uh, crumpling paper in your ear and it hurts. It physically hurts. Um, and then we have balance problems that uh, have an onset, a duration, a frequency, and that is generally correlated with whatever we have going on on the inner ear or sometimes the middle ear. Okay, so sleep rest patterns with tinnitus. So people who have tinnitus, it is, I know you've had tinnitus before. You've had a very quick ringing in your ears out of nowhere, and you're like, whoa, that's really high pitch and kind of annoying. It kind of sounds like something's buzzing in your ear. Um, when I'm talking about tinnitus in this case, I'm talking high pitch ringing doesn't stop. You literally want to just, you know, grab everything out of your ear and just throw it across the room because it's that annoying. It goes on for days, weeks, months, and then it shuts off and usually you lose your hearing. Now, in the case of ototoxicity with Lasix, um, the tinnitus sometimes can get so high pitched um, and then that's followed with just complete nothingness. Um, and sometimes that is permanent. Most of the time it's semi-permanent. Um, most of the time you just get the basic ringing in your ears, but it can become a bigger issue depending on how much you give, how fast you push it, and how dehydrated they are at the time. Um, you'll see these people with massive amounts of tinnitus because it'll be so difficult that they can't pay attention to what they're trying to watch on their TV program. So they will literally crank it up to a 100, not because they can't hear it, because they can. It's because they want to drown out the sound of their tinnitus. So the ringing in the ears is so annoying that they would rather kick the volume up to 100 just to hear something other than the ringing. Um, this, I do recall, is a, a quick blurb that we talk about on our review session. I'm sorry, I'm literally watching my child step on an Aquafina bottle and look at me like, hey, what you doing? Hey, what you doing? You should play with me. Hey, what you doing? Hey, I'm going to make more noise, so this is annoying for you, so you can hurry up with this so we can play. So I apologize. Um, so again, it can cause a massive issue. Um, you will talk to these patients, ask them about their hearing loss, and then when they tell you that they crank up the TV all the way just to go to sleep, you're going to ask them about tinnitus and assess for that because you're going to know that that's the problem at hand. Again, this is on the review. You, honey, you can't brush my hair with a makeup brush. It doesn't work that way, okay? You're better off with a fork like Ariel. Just chill. I'm almost done. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so I think that's all I have for this slide. We'll keep on going. So when we're talking about auditory system issues, um, there are a lot of instances where a person's life is completely different. Um, sometimes uh, you go into neurosensory overload when you have uh, conditions like Meniere's. Um, I know that uh, Meniere's is directly tied with autism. I, I can't tell you the why behind that, but there is um, about 42% of people who have autistic spectrum also have Meniere's. I am one of those super duper lucky people. So I will go from being totally okay to popping my ears the wrong way or chewing on something. And then I go from that to super dizzy. Um, I've dealt with it for my whole life. So I'm pretty good about knowing when it pops up. I keep Dramamine in my purse at all times. Um, anyone who knows me knows that when it happens, um, you usually go deaf for a month at a time. It's usually whenever we have pressure changes. Um, so anytime I go out of state, like Tennessee, where you hit the mountains and you start popping, I know I'm going to be deaf for a month Like after that's done. It just is what it is. Um, it's always my left side. It's never my right. Um, it's, it's kind of most people that have unilateral Meniere's. Um, so with it being one side that's foggy, it's even worse because you get, um, you know, your equilibrium is constantly off. So if you guys ever see me and I seem to be struggling walking, I'm not drunk. I swear I don't drink. <laughs> it's that I'm having an exacerbation of uh, the pressure changes in my inner ear and it's messing with my ability to have good balance and gait. Um, so these are, like I said, this is very common in people with autism spectrum, um, and they actually look the same as well. So you treat it the same way. You um, say, hey, back off of the salt diet, although in my case that has nothing to do with anything, but traditionally Meniere's is attributed to 
um, salt crystals. Um, and I'll get into that when we talk about Meniere's, but just know that a diet, uh, this, an expectation of diet is that you're going to have to lay off of the salt, which I do believe we talked about in the review. So there's that. Um, let's see what else I can tell you about that. So here's the thing. When you have um, neurosensory issues, um, sometimes a sound is physically painful. So some sounds for me is so gut-riching that my body jumps just from the sound. Not because I'm afraid of the jump. It's not a jump scare reaction. It's a literally someone pushed me in the chest with the force of 10,000 men um, as I'm hearing the sound like simultaneously. So it's not something that is a, a, a fear reaction because I, I don't have jump scare reaction just because, you know, I am what I am. So it's, um, it, it's very physically painful not just to your ear but to to refer to your entire body um sometimes if if i hear a certain sound it it um is a bizarre reaction and a lot of people that have these ear problems also have the same problem sometimes um synesthesia is a problem and that's where you um, hear things but you feel pain or um, you hear things and um, it's referred to a different part of your body and it's bizarre and it doesn't make any sense it's just um, look at it as electrical conductivity that's firing off at such a rapid rate that it can't um, articulate where the sound is supposed to be transmitted so it just kind of transmits everywhere um, so keep that in mind because when you're dealing with social life um, like your self-image like your personal life man you might as well just give it up <laughs> because I'm gonna be honest with you it's really hard to relate to another individual it's bad enough with autism spectrum disorder but it's even weirder when you have something like that and you're trying to keep your cool on a first date um, because those usually don't last very long when you start to get vestibular cochlear issues because you know you chewed and it popped the wrong way and all of a sudden you're like holding your head up with one arm trying to act like you're interested but you're really just trying to make the room stop spinning <laughs> it makes for a very very bad experience and it happens more often than not um so i will tell you that it will absolutely cause a strain on your self-actualization so keep that in mind because it it's debilitating sometimes especially um if you're an older person that's never happened and it happens to you and you realize that you know, you have a, a benign um, meningioma that's literally sitting on that, that cranial nerve and you wake up one morning and can't hear on one side and don't know what the heck's happening. So I think that's all I got for this slide. I'll keep on moving forward. So I'm not going to get into sexual reproductive patterns because that's silly. I'm just, we're not going to go there. Not with this. Um, I can tell you that a my kid likes to hit buttons to distract me but more importantly relationships like I said when you're so worried about just trying to keep your head up and keep straight and stop the nausea and the dizziness this all happened in at one time um, you're hypersensitive to light at that same time so like I said this this really mirrors autism spectrum in a lot of ways um, so your light sensitivity gets really bad um, your fluorescent lights all of a sudden start flickering more than they usually do and that's very distracting acting um, if you're like me and you're at work when it happens you've got 9,000 alarms going off you got call lights going off and ironically enough no nurses in the hallway to answer them um, usually your techs are frustrated and exhausted because they run around like crazy people trying to manage their day and then they have to tag along and take care of nursing stuff too that's delegated so it's really hard to walk in a straight line, right? Well, when alarms are going off and lights are going crazy and uh, physical light is flashing all over the place, it really hinders your ability to you know, to do that hobnob with people and relate to them while you're in a work environment. So you don't make friends very often because you're just trying to keep afloat <laughs> and you're trying to keep from falling down so keep that in mind because these guys will have a lot of problems and it's embarrassing there I said it it's embarrassing for me to know that I'm having an attack <laughs> and my balance is off 
and I don't know how long it's going to take to fix it. I, I keep sticking my finger in my ear. I keep trying to open up my auditory canal so that I can at least get a little bit of pressure. I'm popping my nose. People are literally going, God bless you. And I'm like, I'm not sneezing. I'm popping my ear. Then they look at you funny. Like it, it's a whole thing. Um, and it's stressful and, um, there's really not a whole heck of a lot you can do to make matters worse. You see home remedies at the very bottom. One of the home remedies that used to be done back in the old, old, old days, uh, especially in native communities, indigenous communities is the answer was to blow smoke in your ear. <laughs> so as a five-year-old child with soldier stomping in my ear, because I'm literally hearing my heartbeat because I have an effusion in my ear and more than likely a perforation because I've had several of those. And that's not fun either. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it's pretty common with Meniere's. But also, I have someone literally blowing a pipe smoke, tobacco smoke, into my ear to fix this problem. Let me tell you, that is not the answer. That is the worst thing a person can do, period. But that was the thing that they used to do back then. So these home remedies, you're going to hear some baffling remedies. And you're just going to have to keep a straight face and go, well, that's interesting. And then uh, when you try to educate them, be very gentle because... Some of these people, this is their entire culture, so um, it's going to be a culture shock for them. So just keep in mind, it's stressful, it's hard to cope with, um, and give them a little extra time and try to be empathetic to the fact that they're walking kind of crazy because they're really not joking. I mean, it's really a thing. So I'm not really going to get a whole lot into this slide. We got exams on my Monday class tomorrow, and I'm trying to get through these slides and the I slides while I have a kid who is trying to distract me by all means necessary. So you guys know the objective data. There's physical examination on, on your tables, 21-2, 21-3, and 21-4. Um, go ahead and read this slide. It, there's not a whole heck of a lot that I can explain to you that needs explaining. And again, this is just an extension of that. You want to make sure that when you're talking about ears and problems, specifically when you're talking to neuro, because they will call you before they assess the patient and come all the way down. Um, and they're going to ask you these questions, you know, what, are they having any fluid coming out? Is it bloody? Because if it is, that's a TBI, that's a bigger issue. Um, it could also mean a perforation, which is another problem. Um, you know, is, is everything looking okay? Is everything seem to be intact, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, audiometry. It is your hearing acuity screening. Um, this basically lets you know the degree of hearing loss and the type of hearing loss. So this is, um, they use a audiometer. It produces pure tones at varying intensities. Now, please understand that this isn't a decibel test. This is going to be an intensity test. So they're going to use the same, you know, C minor or whatever they use. Um, and it's just going to get higher and higher um, as far as the amplitude is concerned and lower and lower to determine how functional your hearing actually is and, and what that looks like for you. So we will also do what's called a whisper test. Um, and a whisper test is when we stand about 12 to 24 inches away from the patient, we go to one side of their ear and um, we whisper a series of numbers like we'll say, 6213, but we'll whisper it and then we'll ask them to repeat it. So if they're not able to repeat it, then we do it again, but just a, a hair bit louder to see uh, what their functionality is. And then sometimes we will go all the way in the auditory system screenings to do, like I said, decibels, hertz, um, and then a normal speech is 40 to 65 decibels and 500 to 4,000 hertz. Um, so when you have anything that is 40 to 45 decibels of loss, that's moderate difficulty in hearing and normal speech and um, hearing aids, obviously um, it amplifies the sound of the speech, but it does not clarify the speech. So those are two different parts. Um, so if you are unable to understand the reception of speech, it doesn't matter how, how, how loud it is because you're still going to hear Womper Jaw coming through. So I do want you to know that that is a separate entity of its own. All right, here's when we get into uh, the otitis media, um, the various conditions that you're going to have, um, impacted cerumen and what that means, foreign bodies, trauma, injury, cancers. Um, let's see, middle ear and mastoid otitis media issues, let's see, um, Meniere's like I talked about earlier. So let's just go ahead and jump into those items and let's get this blown through.
All right, so this is classic external otitis or what they call swimmer's ear. Um, it's inflammation or infection. Um, like I said, swimming causes it trauma, um, piercing, infections. Um, you need to watch out for those items. So you're going to have ear pain. And I mean, it's like really, really bad ear pain. It's uh, like you feel like you're going to get knocked out off your block ear pain. Um, and sometimes it's mild. It just depends on how bad the effusion is behind your ear. So the the way it sounds like is it's muffled. So have you ever tried to talk to your friend when you were a kid and you guys were underwater and you were trying to you know talk to each other back and forth? It's literally like that. Um, sometimes you leak out serosanguinous or purulent drainage. Uh, you could have a fever with it as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of an, a nasty process, but easily fixable, easily doable. So there's easy education to um, give immediate relief of symptoms. So you diagnose this by looking at the tympanic membrane. It'll be bulging. Um, it'll not be that pretty pearl gray color. It'll be red. Um, it'll look sad. It'll be weepy. It'll, it'll look at you and say, please help me right? So it says the tympanic membrane. Um, treatment 7 to 14 days. The best part about this is the treatment is very fixable, very quick. So we usually give them an anti-inflammatory like an ibuprofen. Um, if they have von Willebrand because they're a hemophiliac, we usually do Tylenol. Um, a mild analgesia in the way of a drop, but you got to watch out for that because if we have an effusion, do I really want to throw drops in my ear on top of it? So this is the alternative is moist heat, and it really does help a ton. I mean, honestly, the best thing that does work, though, is telling them to go home, get a hair dryer, put it on a low setting, and literally just blast their ear as soon as they get out of the shower, as soon as they feel it starting to have that fluid speech. Um, just go ahead and hit it with the dryer and hit it for about five minutes if you can stand it. Um, if you can't, obviously, just take it away from your ear and go and do it again. And what we want to do is we want to dry out the area, and that's uh, almost an immediate fix. And a lot of times, um, unless there's an infectious process, we're not going to do much of anything else because these heal themselves. And as long as they can do that, we're going to let it ride that way. All right, so cerumen and foreign bodies in external, external area canals. Um, it's from impacted cerumen a lot of times. It's dis it's, there's a lot of discomfort. Um, of course, you have decreased hearing because everything's impacted, so you can't get that auditory clearance. Um, you're going to have the ringing of the ears. You're going to have the vertigo because, again, it's going to change the pressure in that area if it can't breathe, if you will. Um, you need to irrigate it with um, normal saline or an isotonic. Um, we call it an elephant wash. It's a really cool tool if you don't already have one. It's a game changer in the world um, for your little kiddos, your little kiddettes, and you'll find that you love it yourself. Um, so it's a spray bottle, and it's got, um, it's got like a neti pot solution that you pour in there. Or you can just do straight up water, but the neti pot solution is far better. Um, and then you just start, and you make sure you have a kidney basin up under your chin, and then you just let the fun begin because I swear after about 20 squirts, things are coming out of there and you're like, how in the world? I thought my hearing was fine. Um, and then you will remember that last you know, couple of days ago, you threw that Q-tip in really deep and that's why you haven't been able to get it out because you're pushing it back in. So your healthcare provider is going to remove foreign bodies because we got to worry about infectious process. We got to make sure we assess it for perforation to make sure that that did or didn't happen. We have to fix it if it does. I mean, there's a lot going on in between. Um, so I will always check that. Um, you guys, you don't have to worry about it. Um, just once you finish the elephant wash, because you will do that part. Once you finish the elephant wash and it's adequate and they seem to have some type of result, um, then you'll just, you know, fire up the tools and then, you know, I'll, I'll get there when I get there and, and give it a look-see and see what we got going on. Now, you will be helping if something needs done. So, like, if, if uh, ENT comes in, uh, they're going to look at you and go, hey, I got this little kid and I'm going to need help with doing uh, eustachian tubes. Um, because the first thing you have to do is you literally have to get a Q-tip and burn that tympanic membrane with an acid. Um, it, it feels, uh, who, how can I explain this one? Um, it feels like if you bit your tongue and weren't expecting it, but in your ear. Yeah, that's about right. Uh-huh. 
And um, of course, there's a change and exchange in airflow, which is going to make them a little dizzy when it happens. Um, it only happens for a couple of seconds, but there's not a whole lot that you can do. You don't like you can't hit them with Lido in their ear, right? Like that's not a thing. So you have to just go through the screen. I know that sounds terrible, but there's there's a small solution that kind of numbs it a little, but buddy, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do a very good job. So you will be helping out with these things. You will be helping out with microscopy because they're going to be in there with one microscope, um, trying to make sure that they're adjusted appropriately, and then you're going to have to go in there with straight hands and make sure that you are you know doing whatever it is that they need. Um, and and it's not the funnest thing in the world to do, but it's very interesting to watch if you ever get an opportunity to see those procedures I would jump on the opportunity because once you've seen it then it's like a whole new world opens um, in the realm of uh, you know auditory canals and all of a sudden it's easier to understand and interpret HESI questions related to ears. So traumas you're going to have hematomas um, if someone is you know falling if um, you know someone had a boxing injury um, that's uh, perichondritis you're going to have your eardrum trauma and it blows, which is going to give you conductive hearing loss and a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. Um, head trauma, um, injury to the temporal lobe, that's always a really fun day. And then you have your cancers. Most of the time it's um, skin related to sun exposure. You usually hit it with some liquid nitrogen um, and make sure that you educate your patient. Again, hats and sunscreen. I can't tell you how many times. Hats and sunscreen. Sunscreen, sunscreen, don't forget your sunscreen. See those red petechiae papules that you got going on right there on your face and your neck? Yeah, we're sunscreen. That may have been on your review, if I recall, so just keep that in mind. So as we get um, into the middle ear and, and farther into the ear, the infection becomes more infectious than you know something that is external it's getting to the hard wire and the really um the really fragile mucous membrane so that's why it's so easy to get infected if we're introducing anything that's foreign um it's usually in your tympanum or tympanum your ossicles your middle ear you're going to get swelling you're going to get red you're going to get pressure it's going to throb like the dickens um, you're going to get bacteria so sometimes you get some purulent drainage you'll have that bulging membrane that just looks like it's about to pop um, and it's miserable um, when you shine a light on it, it because it's so translucent uh, you can it's like looking inside of an eye you know it's got like that haze of red orange from your light um, as it touches uh, the skin it, it's kind of that deal because um, you, it's it's a translucent process because that it's been stretched beyond beyond uh, its ability basically um, so keep an eye out for that and know that you need to fix that quick because the next thing is a perf and that's never fun um, also you can get fever you're gonna get body aches because it's weird when anything in your face hurts I don't know what it is about your face and um, your lymph nodes of the neck when those guys start feeling just icky not even terrible just icky your whole body aches along with it have you guys ever noticed that it's so bizarre um, but I, I think it's because we're so used to never having pain in our ears that when we do get it our body just goes into overload and everything just starts tripping wires so um, keep that in mind it's incredibly painful to have these middle ear infections so you need to get on them as fast as you can so you usually have oral antibiotics and eardrops. Again, the eardrops, you got to be kind of mindful of them when you're dealing with um, a swimmer's ear and it's that kind of pressure. A lot of times they will tell you to just dry it out versus deal with eardrops, but sometimes it's so painful you don't have a choice, so they will use that alternative. Um, sometimes they have to do uh, surgery and a meringeotomy or a myringeotomy, depending on how you want to pronounce it, it's meringeotomy. Um, you will, you know, have to have things pried open in a pond and they have to sometimes break areas um, depending on where the location is. Um, they also have uh, your, um, your, uh, to panostomy tube um, and that ventilates the ear. Um, we also have the traditional use station. Um, and then you need to make sure that you're on an antihistamine and a nasal corticosteroid because a lot of times this is an allergic process and that's how you end up with these infections. 
So an effusion, we talked about it. It's inflammation in the middle ear with fluid collection. It feels full. It sounds funny like the water talk. It pops. It ruins your hearing. Um, it uh, is basically um, concomitant with acute otitis uh, media that needs to be taken care of. It could last weeks. It could last months. It just depends. Um, and then all of a sudden, it resolves itself with that treatment, and it recurs um, if you had infection, middle ear infections as a child, it's absolutely gonna carry on into adulthood. Um, I've had nothing but ear trouble and it's to the point to where when it happens, it barely even bothers me anymore because I've learned how to, um, how to recalculate my body system so that I can go back to functionality fairly quick. Um, although sometimes it does really knock me for a loop uh, and that is a figurative and literal joke. So there's that. So chronic otitis, uh, media mastoiditis um, also could be painful. Sometimes it's not painful at all. It just depends. Um, sometimes there's purulent drainage. Sometimes there's serous saying it just depends. Um, that seems to be kind of the, the running joke about uh, middle ear infections. It could be nothing or it could be a big thing that is, you know, cataclysmic to your functionality. Um, so you need to make sure that you are doing those uh, exams. Um, or that you're setting your physician up for those exams. Um, sometimes they do a culture and sensitivity of the fluid that's in there. Sometimes they do an audiogram. If that doesn't work, they do an x-ray to see if there's any uh, TMJ or any of those inner ear bones broken, although it's very, very hard with an x-ray. Um, MRI they'll do, um, and then CT scan with contrast is their absolute last ditch effort to figure out what the heck is happening. Um, so do keep that in mind. So our goal is just to clear the infection and make the patient feel better. I mean, it's pretty simple. Uh, you want to get the drainage out. That helps because it helps with that effusion, helps that skin go back to being its normal size and shape. Um, you, sometimes you have to do a mastoidectomy. Um, sometimes there will be impaired hearing. Sometimes it's temporary. Most of the time it's temporary. Uh, make sure that you are doing the worn compresses. Make sure you're doing all the things you need to do to help promote tilt the head into a pillow so that it can catch drainage, so that it can drain down, all the things that make complete and total common sense. Um, so you guys will not have any trouble with any of these questions. So these are hereditary autosomal dominant diseases of conductive air hearing loss in that system um, in young adults. Sometimes they don't know until it's so bad it's too late uh, to really do much of anything to help fix it. It prevents movement of the foot plate and the stapes. And the reason that no amount of hearing aid is going to fix that is we're talking about amplification versus that, that area, that bone physically doesn't move to collect that data. So it's a complete change and a reduction in the transmission of that vibration. And I can hear something, but you got to remember, I want you to think of vibration is the ability to push something with your finger. So I produce words, but essentially uh, when you're talking about uh, metaphysics, um, you produce words and as you're producing those words, it just kind of stands in the air. Now the vibration uh, with which you produce within your diaphragm will physically push it and make it accelerate. So sometimes if I speak really loud, it's because it sounds like this. And then if I speak really fast, you're getting that vibrational pattern a little bit faster. You see what I mean? So it, it depends on how I uh, enunciate my word, which will be determinant of how it's going to be forced into your ear, if that makes any sense at all. So it's not going to work if that plate doesn't move because it can't collect the vibration. So essentially, it just kind of stays in the air um, and just kind of dissipates and evaporates, if that makes any sense. So I want you to know the difference between the two because... Uh, you'll occasionally get an NCLEX question that's going to ask you to decipher the two, and you'll need to know that in the question in order to answer it right. Um, so just keep keep the two in mind. This isn't a uh, this isn't a um, amplification issue. This is the the plates don't move issue. Okay. Um, let's see. The swart sign. It's really easy. It's a reddish discoloration of the promontory area seen during the otoscopic examination. Um, the discoloration is actually a result of the increased blood flow to the promontory due to the characteristic um, otoscleric lesion that's in there. So big words for don't worry about it. It's not going to be in your test. You're never going to be tested on this. Don't even worry about it. Just know short sign has something to do with the ear. How about that? Um, your rind test is your tuning fork. They kick it and it goes ding 
and then about the time it starts to muffle down, they literally stick it to your head, and you should feel the vibration on either side. They'll ask you if one's weaker than the other, or they'll ask you if you feel it at all, um, and then of course they do the traditional audiogram as well. All right, so otosclerosis. So it's just like atherosclerosis, just for the ear. How about that? That makes it easy. Um, the treatment they will give you to help prevent the, the transmutation and uh, the progression of the illness is oral sodium, uh, fluoride, vitamin D, calcium carbonate. Um, and it just kind of kicks it into um, a slower transition from, you know, bad to worse, basically. Um, hearing aids obviously are a thing. The vestibular cochlear nerve implant is if you have a complete dysfunction of that vibrational pattern. Um, which is kind of cool because it's literally a bionic ear. I'm doing that literally thing again. i got to find a new word. Um, but it basically, it, it it's super cool, man. You're like Iron Man all of a sudden. You have this superpower, and I can't wait because people with Meniere's eventually lose their hearing completely. So it's going to be awesome when it happens. I'm going to be like a, a cyborg. Like, how cool is that? Who could say that? So let's see, patient education, avoid sudden movements. Yeah, because the pressure changes. That, that sucks. It's quite miserable um, and again when that inner ear pressure changes sometimes if people aren't used to it they will literally fall to the ground I did the literally again yikes okay we got to do something where I don't know every time I say the word literally I have to pay you know 50 cents into the jar, the jar and at the end of the week we do a raffle and find out who gets the money so the first person that tells me and reminds me of this is going to show me that they've been paying attention. So I'm going to put your name in five times instead of one. How about that? We'll, we'll see if that kicks the habit because it's, it's starting to annoy me because I just realized I've been doing it this whole time. Um, so what they'll do is they'll do um, a transition or they'll do a prosthesis of the stapes. So they'll take the babbin out, put the going in. Sometimes that helps out. And if not, they just go straight for the bionic ear, which is super cool and also covered under your insurance. Okay, so manifestations of inner ear disease. This is the functionality part that you need to know because it's always going to come back up. There's the vestibular labyrinth, and that has specifically to do with vertigo and vertigo only. Vestibular vertigo, that's easy to remember. The auditory labyrinth is sensorial or neurosensor, neurosensory hearing loss um, with ringing in the ears or tinnitus. So if you hear it, it's auditory. V and V go together. That's an easy way to remember it if you happen to forget it. All right, and then we have the dreaded Meniere's, uh, which is the accumulation of the endolymph and the membranous labyrinth. It is progressive. Eventually, it goes all together, um, and the bionic ear is necessary at that point. The etiology, we don't really know. We know that there's a tie, again, like I said earlier, between autism spectrum, but we don't know if the autism spectrum disorder creates the Meniere's or if the proponent or one of the proponents to the autism spectrum disorder and the inability to understand how normal neuromotor and sensory things are, um, are, are created between one and the other from person to environmental trigger. Um, but they're intercorrelated and we know that and we're still working on trying to figure that out. Me personally, I think that the Meniere's that starts to develop in utero um, causes trouble because babies can hear in utero. Um, I think that starts the process of causing trouble that creates the sensory overload that creates the person with spectrum disorder who is sensitive to every environmental factor, you know, like touch, touch, taste, smell, you know, sight, the whole, the whole gambit. Um, it's usually in people, uh, gets really, really bad when they go from 30 to 60 years. I've noticed that I've gone from ear infections to my twenties where I go from ear infections to this weird vestibular cochlear business to like full on Meniere's. And I know exactly what it's like now. Um, I've been told that this is about as how bad it gets. So that's super cool because I've adjusted to it over time. Um, and it does happen in women more than men. Okay, so um, I don't feel like I need to go over this because I gave you the spoiler alerts way earlier. So excessive fluid loss and pressure, yep, check. Hearing imbalance problems, gotcha. Um, disability, mm, that word's kind of weird for me. So I'm going to say it's not a disability. Um, well, I guess it is. It disables you from your regular sentence. Okay, I'll buy into that. But I'm, I, I'm not a fan of that word, to be fair. Um, so sudden severe attacks of vertigo, and boy, is it ever sudden. It goes from cool to oops. 
Um, nausea, vomiting goes with that. It's uh, kind of terrible. Um, sweating. You feel like the world is on fire. You really do. Um, and it's unpredictable. Like I said, it, it could be when I go driving and I'm headed to Tennessee, I know I'm going to run into it and I know it's going to be a problem because it traditionally is. So I prepare myself for the worst. Um, and I, I've gotten over the years better at being able to manage it. Um, you're going to get fullness in the ear. You're going to hear that watered muffled talk. Um, when you hear high pitched sounds, it, it drags on for longer than it would sound if I heard it with a normal ear, if that makes any sense. It's like, like the, the linear time frame with which I hear begin and end of pitch elongates. It's so bizarre. It's like that wavelength purposely just gets longer as it tries to push its way through, again, through you know, the metaphysic perspective of a scolarity, if you will. Um, it, it pushes through and it takes a lot longer um, and it's miserable. Like I said, it's, it's really hard to understand what someone's doing. So you learn how to read lips, which is why I always joke, hey guys, I read lips because of what I have. So y'all better watch out what you're saying because if I look at, you know, 200 yards of pace, that's enough for me to be able to tell what you're saying. So watch yourself. Um, and it's a running joke because I really don't care. You guys be you. Um, some experience feelings of being pulled to the ground. Like I said, these drop attacks, like everything's cool. And then you're down on one side, like eating the pavement. It's, um, it's really that dramatic. Again, I haven't had this happen in probably 25 years. God, I'm old. Yeah. At least 25 years. Um, and, and I wasn't prepared for it and now I know what to watch out for. So it doesn't happen. Um, it can last hours. It can last days. It can last uh, again, uh, several times a year. Um, my hearing loss is always the left side. It's usually for a month to a month and a half. It happens twice a year. It's on clockwork. It's actually coming in the next couple of weeks. So I'm super excited about that. Um, because everything's gonna have to go in the right ear for you guys. And if it doesn't, I'm not going to get it at all. So uh, apologies in advance. So when we're trying to diagnose how bad the Meniere's is, we do a couple of things. We do an audiogram like we always do um, to see if they have those low frequency uh, receptions. Um, they do the spontaneous vertigo on two occasions. So like if I have had it twice in the last 10 years, that would be criteria to do a check mark and say, okay, that's another um, diagnostic test that we've run through. Um, abnormal vestibular, vestibular uh, tests, that is when um, they will put fluid into your ear purposefully and basically throw you into a state of um, being of in unbalance um, or they'll have you pop your ears until you get that way because you can, you can actually um, force yourself to do this. Um, it's not fun, but you can, you can just catch it right on if you wanted to. Um, and then they do the glycerol test and the glycerol test is they usually do like 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight um, ingestion of glycerol and the, the transient reduction of hearing loss in the early stage of Meniere's is improved. And that'll let you know, hey, there is improvement. This is the earlier stage of Meniere's versus the later stage where it would do nothing at all. Um, there is no cure for it. Hooray! So treatments to reduce frequency and severity of vertigo attacks is basically the main the main um, precursor for you know wanting to seek treatment because there's there's no fixing it there's no nothing um, there are, like I said are acute attacks sometimes corticosteroids could be okay um, antihistamines um, anticholinergics anticholinergics as you well remember like succicoline will take the fluid from the body we use it often when we're doing surgical procedures so people don't choke on their own saliva and then we do benzodiazepines sometimes I've never done the benzodiazepine method before um, me being me I like to have complete control of my brain um, because it's of high value to me so I'm not a big fan of the benzos um, at least I don't think I am because I've given people benzos and I watch how they act and you guys are not gonna catch me looking like that that's that so um, bed rest is a big deal, um, making sure that you're in low light so that you don't trip yourself into sensory overload, um, anti-emetics, um, and anavert um, is a good one, uh, or what they call um, meclizine versus minadrine. I hope I just said that right. I do. I get it mixed up too, and I'm the one that takes it. Um, and or Dramamine is a good one too. Um, so yeah, that's what you do for that to just try to fix the symptoms because that's all you're fixing is the symptoms. 
So between the tax, they want to keep you on a diuretic sometimes, but that can be tricky because if you get on a diuretic and then you get dehydrated, that's never good. Um, corticosteroids, you have to watch out for that. I choose not to do corticosteroids because I don't want osteoporosis. So I've been vitamin Ding it up since I was about 22 years old because I'm not playing with osteoporosis, broken bones, porous bones. That is not my jam. Um, keep a low sodium diet. Remember that may be on your test. Um, and reduce your stress because remember if we trigger the sympathetic nervous system response because we're super stressed all it's going to do is make that pain worse um, and if you've ever been calm when you cut yourself on accident you're fine and then you realize you cut yourself and then that's when the throbbing pain starts it's because we trigger that response um, so making sure that you have surgical intervention sometimes they can decompress it um, I've not had any luck with that um, vestibular nerve uh, section um, or they can ablate it all together. I'm not a fan of putting any utensils in me and doing surgery. If I'm going to do surgery, it's going to be to fix the problem and not to um, fix a symptom that's going to come and go as it pleases anyways. Um, and then they do gentamicin injections, which again is kind of dicey because we're throwing in an antibiotic and introducing it into an ear process that really isn't necessarily an effective process, but it does have a little bit of alleviation with it just because it's technically a type of otitis media, yada, 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 pathophysiology. Y'all don't need to worry about it. Just know that genomycin injections are sometimes an alternative method to try to treat the symptoms of um, having this disease. So vertigo, you need to keep them in a dark, quiet room. You need to avoid sudden movements. It's like a kaleidoscope. And if you move and the room is already moving in an opposite direction, it's really going to throw them off. It's really going to make them super nauseous. So make sure that's going on. Closing eyes, mm, I don't agree with that. So if you close your eyes and then you open your eyes back again and the vertigo is still there, you've just introduced it all over again for the first time versus the theory of desensitization, which is what I would do and what I do. Um, I usually hit the corner of the wall and I focus on that until it stays still and at that point I'm good to go because I have changed the process in my brain which tells my body that that is aligned in that place and it is not moving anymore. Um, but of course if your book says do close the eyes during vertigo and that's an that's a option, do that, just whatever the book says. Um, avoid fluorescent flickering lights and TV. Yeah, it's like um, it's like a light show going on at all times. It's like watching a thunderstorm that doesn't stop uh, with fluorescent lights, and it can make you feel like you're about to seize sometimes because it's like, oh boy, I, I can't, I can't deal. Um, and then make sure that you get them in emesis basin. I've never been physically sick from an episode, um, but I've been awful nauseous and felt like, oh boy, this, this might be it. Um, but I've been lucky enough to, to not have um, that happen. And again, when you're dealing with someone who has transient Meniere's, like they, they just kind of get it out of nowhere um, or they get it late into their 30s and they haven't had all of these signs and symptoms like I have before, um, it hits them like a ton of bricks versus someone who's been dealing with it since they were a kid. Um, because some of these people, they get it and it's more of a trauma related incident versus a genetic proponent. Um, and I really feel bad for those guys because could you imagine how long it takes to adjust? It's, it's not easy at all. So if you guys are noticing, there's a lot of slides on Meniere's and it's because Meniere's is starting to become a bigger deal than we once thought. As we find that more females are, you know, coming up with autism spectrum disorder, as we find that there's more trauma related incidents of Meniere's disease, we're realizing that we need to teach people about it more, um, especially because I, gosh, I feel like, I feel like I get dizziness and vertigo probably is 30% of my population um, at my facility that, well, that I was previously at when I was on my last contract. So it, it is quite common. Um, so you really have to watch these signs and symptoms and you will see these again, whether it be in your HESI, I promise you, you'll see Meniere's disease in your HESI. That's why I'm taking so much time. Um, because if you know me and you know who I am and I tell you about my disease process and it is hundred percent on point with our slides, you will not forget it. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you about my life because I just need for everyone to know, you know, how I exist in the world because I honestly don't care. What I do care about is you succeeding and you can associate it with the person that you see every single day. And it's also kind of funny when I have an episode and you're like, hey, are you drunk? And I'm like, no, I don't drink. Um, and you see me trying to get my bearings about. So again, if that happens, I'm sorry. 
Um, so it's going to be easy for you to remember. It's going to come up um, on your NCLEX. I, gosh, how many questions did I get on ears? Probably 10. Yeah, I was, I was that person who got ears and eyes, um, but more ears than anything, which I was cool with because I was like, oh, yeah, I know that one. That's an easy one, right? Because I've had ear problems my whole life. So make sure you know the ears. They really like to hit hard on ears um, just because it has so much to do with vestibular cochlear dysfunction, tumors, um, you know, facial nerves, cranial nerves are involved. It, it's a big thing. So you got to hit hard on this. I'm so sorry. So from the last slide, I also wanted to mention, in addition to everything else that we talked about that you need to do for patient safety, you also need to monitor intake and output. And if you recall, the reason we're monitoring intake and output is because we're giving them what? Diuretics, so that we can kick off of this fluid whenever we have these exacerbations. So you gotta make sure that they're peeing and they're getting enough fluid intake because we can fluid overload and basically do nothing because we're you know, introducing more in there. Or we could do the inverse and get so dehydrated that we start having problems with the rest of our body systems. So vertigo is also caused by free floating debris or ear rocks. Um, in the uh, semicircular canal, um, it's usually attributed with head movements that are done pretty fast. This is what you call BPPV, benign proximal positional vertigo. So the treatment for this is wild. <laughs> it is a wild ride to see this happen. Um, the symptoms, they get nystagmus. It's awful. They get loss of balance. They get severe nausea. These are the guys that drop to the ground. Um, they get auditory and vestibular testing uh, to say that, hey, that this is it. And then they do the Epley maneuver. Now, if you have any physical therapist who is specialized in vertigo treatment and management, what they do is they literally get your head and they slam it down as hard as they can. I'm not even joking. The way they did this 25 years ago is even worse. <laughs> 25 years ago. They would tell you that the way you fix this is you go to your knees next to your bed, if your bed was short, and if it was tall, get on the bed, and you would literally throw your body down into the mattress, <laughs> if you can believe that that was the thing. And that was how you would shake up these crystals, because I'm telling you, you can literally hear these crystals in your ear sometimes, because they get just right where they need to be, to be annoying, and it, it literally sounds like like rocks scraping together, like you're trying to scrape and start a fire type of a deal with some flint. Um, it is that bizarre of a sound and it, it will trip you up when you're talking because you'll focus on that more than what you're saying and forget what you're saying, which makes you look like you're incompetent and then it causes a whole bunch of um, social issues, right? Because you're so hyper-focused on this weird sound that you have in your ear. Um, so that is the Epley Maneuver. Uh, it, it, it is quite, like I said, if you ever get an opportunity to see these guys in action, it is wild to watch it. It's, it's something, something else for sure. All right, you get the acoustic neuroma as well. Um, unilateral benign tumor where vestibular cochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8 enters um, the internal auditory canal. Uh, early diagnosis is, import, is important so that you don't... Um, keep compressing on the trigeminal and facial nerves and arteries because this can cause trigeminal neuroglasia. We will get into that neuro. It literally, ah, there's 50 cents. It literally, there's a dollar, um, makes uh, the most painful feeling you've ever had. And it's going from everything is fine to I've physically gotten stabbed with a four inch K bar, um, which is a military grade um, blade. Uh, it's, it's, it's that bad. Um, I've had two patients that have had it and you know you have them because it goes from dead silent in the hallway to blood curdling scream to dead silent again and then you hear immediate crying uh, because it's that jarring to the body system and that traumatic for them to have that happen to them. So again, with acoustic neuromas, you're going to have unilateral progressive neurosensory um, hearing loss, reduced touch sensation in the posterior ear canal, um, unilateral tinnitus, mild intermittent vertigo, um, and they do a neurologic test for that, um, automatic, an autometric test, vestibular test, CT scans, and an MRI. Sometimes these need to be removed. Um, believe it or not, uh, when I was at Miami Valley six years ago, 
Um, I started on neuro ICU and our nurse practitioner had an acoustic neuroma. He said he um, woke up in the morning and was on his pillow and his wife was talking to him and he rolled over and realized that there's no need to roll over. That ear was wide open and he couldn't hear anything. And it was because it had finally gotten so large, it had stopped that production of, of uh, the neurosensory mechanism that produces, you know, speech that is understandable. Um, so he had to have, um, obviously, a craniotomy, a very small one. And he was fine after that, no problem, uh, because these are benign processes. But just make sure you can try to get to them as fast as you can. They will be complaining of um, this type of unilateral tinnitus that turns into um, mild vertigo that turns into just to complete uh, hearing loss. So treatments are surgical removal like we just talked about, stereostatic radiosurgery. Um, they're going to report clear colorless discharge from the nose. Um, it's possibly um, cerebral spinal fluid. If they report these things, then they need to come back. You've got to educate them on that. It is not okay for you to lose cerebral spinal fluid ever, 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 ever. Um, sometimes people um, will tell me that that's going on um, and they feel it. They say that they can, they can hear it moving about um, in their head, which is never a good sign either. Um, we usually hear this when we're dealing with someone who has a pick line and they put the pick line and it goes all the way up to the jugular and to the brain and they don't know that they've got it there and they will go to pop the syringe to flush and they'll go, well, that's weird. And they'll, they'll say, what's wrong? And they go, I don't know. I just heard that in the back of my ear. And it, then I felt it in the back of my neck and heard it in the back of my neck. And about that point, they're pulling back on the pick line <laughs> because we've got it into the wrong spot. We need to, we need to back it down a little bit, put it back in the subclavian where it belongs. Um, so these things, they, they do happen. And that's why we have to be very vigilant in our assessment and understanding Understanding what that means for them so that we can get them immediate treatment. So you do need to know that conductive hearing is external and middle ear. You need to know that conductive hearing is just basic hearing loss from aging. Um, neurosensory, I, I don't know why they set, call it sensory neuro, it, that always messes me up. So neurosensory uh, is in your inner ear and that's distortion of faintness of sound. That's the ability to understand speech and speech reception. Um, and that is complete hearing loss. So that's a big, big problem in the world. This is, again, where we would need to do all of the surgical interventions, potentially a prosthesis. And then if none of that works, then dun -dun -dun -dun, we are a bionic man. So central hearing um, impairment means that you're going to have problems understanding the meaning of the words that were heard. Um, how, can I under, how can I explain that? Um, so you could tell me – oh, here's a good one. So you can tell me um, – the the cat chased a rat and I'll hear your cat is fat that's how that works and and I think that that is self-explanatory at this point so I think you guys got this so I like this slide because it breaks everything down um, again you're gonna need to know what disease process goes in what part of the head so you're gonna need it for your um, NCLEX you're gonna need it for your HESI I can promise you that so if I were you I would go ahead and draw a diagram just like this and just commit it to memory. Um, the easiest way I remember this is the really, really nasty stuff is to the right. The basic stuff we always hear about is in the middle and the boring stuff is to the left. And that's the stuff we can fix pretty quick, right? So if it, that helps you at all, um, if you see anything other than Meniere's or noise induced hearing loss from per perforation or ototoxicity from medication, Lasix or um, uh, presbycusis, then it only falls into the middle if it's not swimmer's ear or something's in my ear or um, I've got an external ear infection, right, which is self-induced from swimming. So maybe that helps you. I don't know. Hopefully that will. So here's something wild about conductive hearing loss. They actually hear better in big crowds, which I don't understand that at all, but I would be really interested in hearing about that later on in life. So I'm going to put that on my list of things to learn because I, I found that out uh, probably about 25 minutes ago, and I thought, well, that's nuts. Um, so I don't know exactly how that works. Uh, so I will read the book and find out um, if it says any more like you guys do. Um, so conductive hearing loss is sound transmission to the inner ear that is impaired. Um, and again, otitis media with effusion, impacted cerumen, perforation of the, um, the tympanic membrane, 
uh, otoscleris, narrowing of the external auditory canal. That basically is uh, what covers th that um, conductive hearing loss um, milieu, if you will. So with conductive hearing loss, they talk low because the pitch with which they hear things is so high, they feel like they're yelling. I, I, hopefully that makes more sense to you. And I know you probably uh, have experienced that at least once in your life. Um, again, we use audiograms to determine if that's a thing. Uh, we identify and treat it, and if we can't correct it, we do a hearing aid. So neurosensory hearing loss is you can hear, but you don't understand the speech that you're hearing. So it just sounds muffled. Um, it can lead to many misunderstandings. The fun part about me is when I have this happen um, and I, I do have this trouble understanding what you're saying is I'm going to start hearing some bizarre things and I'm going to look at you like, I know I just didn't hear you say that. And you're going to go, what did you just say? And I'm never going to tell you what I just heard because it was so bad. I refuse to repeat it. So try not to mess with me too much. I understand that this is a vulnerability I'm letting all my students know about. So you guys could technically pick on me and would totally get away with it. So I'm going to trust that you're only going to do that about one or two times. And then the haha -ha joke is going to be over. I'll, I'll give you two solid dupes. And then after that, you're done. Cool. That's, I feel like that's fair um, because I have told you, which means I've set you up for failure already because everyone's excited now about doing it. Um, it does sound muffled. It is difficult to understand. Again, audiogram and hearing aids, and then you're done. Neurosensory hearing losses, the impairment of the inner ear, vestibular cochlear nerve 8, congenital and hereditary factors, noise exposure, aging with presbycusis, Meniere's trauma, and ototoxicity. Now, in addition to... Lasix that we already know, which is our loop diuretic. There are other medications. So um, aspirin will do it if you have an overdose of aspirin. So um, people who, um, who try to take their lives in adolescence um, often do it with aspirin because that's all their parents have. So they will, um, I almost said the L word, they all, they basically just take, you know, a whole bottle of aspirin and it causes severe tinnitus. We still have to pump their stomach because it can cause a lot of problems specifically with their liver, with their belly and ulcerations. I mean, it's a big thing. Um, and it's a terrible thing as well. Um, so that will absolutely cause it. Antibiotics, certain ones will. Vancomycin, I believe, is one of them. I might be lying to you. Double check me. Um, NSAIDs will do it as well. Um, anti-malarial agents. Oh, boy. If you ever went overseas and had to do anti-malarial agents, um, not only do you have weird dreams, like, you know, pigs are biting your feet, um, but this is a pretty common um, occurrence with... Um, the hearing loss as well and the severe tinnitus. Um, the chemotherapy drugs can also cause this problem because it kills kind of everything um, because it's a nonspecific target. So when you're dealing with mixed hearing loss, um, you are dealing with conductive and neurosensory causes. So you're going to have the best of both worlds. Central and functional hearing loss uh, is more central nervous system related and you can't interpret the sound. Um, and you have to go to hearing and speech services to get a host of, of functional tests to make sure that things are running appropriately. And if not, um, then you might have to get a turbo ear or a hearing aid. And if that doesn't work, then, of course, we go to the bionic. Um, it can be physiologically or emotionally related um, because a lot of times when you have a, a great deal of mental trauma um, or you have a history of seizures or you have a tumor um, it will cause instability to interpret that sound remember if I'm upset um, then everything all my senses are triggered right because we're in a sympathetic nervous system so everything is heightened um, so you become the you become Peter Parker that gets bit by the spider the first couple of minutes of it right as soon as he gets home so these things are going to amplify. So the things that you hear because you're in high alert and because you are in a very emotional state, um, you're going to have a disruption of that speech. It's just it's normal. If you're if you're thinking irrational, then you're not perceiving rational. You know, it's, it's common sense. You guys got this one. So I'm going to stop talking about this one because you don't need me to. So genetics, um, hereditary hearing loss is a thing. Um, it alters your function. Um, you have 400 syndromes that include hearing loss along with other clinical abnormalities. 
no pressure. So this is why it's so important in your assessment to be very specific about what's going on with your patient. Do I spend? Does the room spend? That kind of thing. So clinical manifestations of hearing loss and deafness. Inappropriate responses. Straining to hear. Cup in the hand. Doing the, you ready? The, eh? Huh? Right? The, um, the leaning into you and breaking your personal bubble. Reading lips. Oh, that's a big one. Let me tell you. Increased sensitivity to increased noise. Um, sudden hearing loss. Sudden deafness. Um, rapid loss of hearing. Right? Usually just affects one ear. Um, it is a medical emergency if that just happens out of the blue. It usually means that there's a perforation, um, which is never good, and we'll talk about that here in a second, I do believe. By the way, the signs and symptoms of hearing loss, you need to pay attention to those because I believe it's on your review. So I need for you to know that when they do the, uh, right, or they ask you to repeat, or they cup their hand, or they lean into you and break your personal bubble, uh, that is directly associated with that. So here is our lady who's a literer who speaks unusually loud, which is another sign of hearing loss. Seems to misunderstand what you're saying quite frequently. What do you do? Well, I would do the whisper test. That would make the most sense to me because that's something that I can do as a nurse, right? We don't have to stick anything in any ears. We don't have to know any diagnostics. I don't have to perform any, you know, audiology testing that I don't have in a clinical care setting or an ECF setting or in a primary care setting necessarily. Um, so this is probably the best one. And then if they fail it, then tell your physician and then they will do further evaluation. So modifiers to people who are um, losing their hearing or are deaf. Uh, we want to have modifiers like visual aids. They need to understand that we understand. Um, it is an unseen handicap. Sign language, ASL um, is a big thing. Um, uh, the ADA requires to have interpreter consents for discharge teaching, so that's going to be a thing. Uh, the OBN also requires that, like, you need to make sure that all of your governing bodies um, are in compliance with what they require. Um, so you need to make sure that you have these modifiers. And we have um, things like Marty that you can clock into and get an interpreter. And ASL is one of those as well. It's a standard form um, of American Sign Language. Um, problems with communication and interactions. The patient's unaware or denies impairment. A lot of times they will mask being deaf. So they will look at you and just shake their head and smile. And it's usually like a nervous weirdo. Think Sheldon Cooper when he smiles and you go, ooh, cringe, right? It's like that um, because they, they don't understand what you're saying. But they're going to try to not let you know that they don't understand what you're saying because they don't want to be impolite. Um, and it's also embarrassing to not be able to hear. Um, so they will play the uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh, no, yeah. And they'll read your lips as best as they can. And they can usually catch up really well. Um, what I can figure out to decipher if it's a thing or not is I will say a sentence with my back turned to see if they answer me. And then you're good. You're good from there. So noise is the most prevalent cause of hearing loss. Um, you'll hear about this when you're, you know, talk to anybody who's ever served in the military, has ever been out on the other side of the pond. They will absolutely tell you that they have hearing loss on one or both ears, depending on what their job was. Um, EOD, those guys lose their ears fast. Um, anyone who's infantry, they will lose their ears fast. Anyone who does aircraft, um, or flight line or PAX terminal, they're going to lose their hearing very easily. Even with the earplugs, it doesn't make a difference, right? Because over a period of time, your body adjusts to the vibration you have around you and anything um, other than you sticking it in so hard that it gives you an ear infection, I'm talking about the squeezy earplugs that you use, it, it, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, it, it makes a difference as far as the amplitude is concerned, but a lot of times the vibrationary the vibrational patterns um, within a, a jet engine is very jarring, and that's why these guys crouch when they, you know, take stakes out and such. So you got to keep that in mind because um, they can still wear their protective hearing gear, and it, it doesn't make a difference in the world um, a lot of times. So we want to promote uh, health and hearing. Um, you need to make sure you do a noise exposure analysis. 
Um, making sure that you stay away from exposure that's over like a 70 decibel level is very important. You need to do periodic hearing screenings. That's why we see these a lot in schools. You'll see it um, in elementary school, they'll do one. In high school, I think they do one. And then in middle school, I think they do two. Um, just to make sure that they're not missing anything along the way that would decrease your ability to understand the material that you're being taught. Okay, so after we're talking for a little bit, we find out that she works in a factory. She, or he, sorry, there's a he apparently. I don't know why I thought it was a she. He retired 10 years ago. Um, he tripped on the steps and hit his head last night. Uh, oh, we might have vestibular cochlear issues and balance and gait abnormality. What types of hearing loss could we be experiencing? Well, we just said it. So let's keep on moving on with our case study. So you continue and you realize that they've been um, recently on antibiotics for UTI. Um, why is this complete review of medications especially important in this case? Well, we just talked about it earlier. What causes this abnormality of hearing, which can sometimes cause this abnormality of balance? And the answer is medication, specifically what? Antibiotics for UTI. So that makes 100% sense. So maybe this is a medication issue and we just need to swap medications and lay off of the other stuff. All right, so health promotion, immunizations, um, fetal damage can be caused by viruses, so you want to make sure that you get all of your injections that you can get. Immunizations, I'm a big fan of them. I'm a big fan of not getting terrible things because I didn't get an injection because I was afraid of a needle. So try to do health promotion with that. Try to get these guys vaccinated like they need to be. Um, make sure you do it with children and adults. So there is a huge incident um, or uh, a new prevalence of um, old diseases that we used to have that are coming back. So uh, let's see, what's a big one? Measles. Measles used to be almost not even a thing anymore. And then we got my generation that came through and was like, I'm going to do everything organic. And I totally, I think that's rad. Good for you. That's amazing. And then they go, I'm not going to give them MMRs. And then all of a sudden, measles and mumps is a thing. And it's debilitating. And it can cause really, really big problems. Like, people die from this stuff. And they didn't, you know, they thought the federal government was, you know, putting nanobots in their in their immunizations and their kids were going to get it microchipped. And I'm like, really? Have you ever heard of a little thing called, I don't know, an x-ray of your head? Because you would see it. So stop. You've had 15 MRIs because you're a hypochondriac and keep saying you're having a stroke. Please stop. That's nuts. Now, if there's a religious preference, I totally get it. I totally dig it. Nine times out of ten, though, it's just based off of the fact that they don't understand what it really means. They think they're doing a really great thing. They think that they are protecting their children from an environmental problem. And I get that and I understand it, but they don't look at the science. They just hear what they hear on TikTok. And guess what? TikTok is not a doctor. I watched TikTok a couple of days ago and I laughed at some of the things that I heard because they're really teaching these people these things and people are believing them and they could not be farther from the truth. So unless they have a medical degree and have dedicated their life to science, we need to find a way to get them to understand that that's not a thing. So good luck. I'm still trying to figure it out. If you guys find out before I do, educate me. Let me know because this is something I can never tap into. These guys are that adamant about not giving their kids immunizations no matter what the cost even if it hurts other children so just if you figure it out let me know that'd be great so again we want to teach them to stay away from ototoxic substances um, industrial chemicals are a big one make sure that if they work in a factory they're getting proper monitoring uh, there should be someone who works um, within EPA standards to make sure that the chemicals do not get into uh, the pores of, you know, someone working in a factory so they don't get exposed to these contaminants, but sometimes it also does happen. So um, just make sure that they are getting checked out every so often um, and to make sure that they're letting us know what these chemicals are so we can research them and then see if these have ototoxic properties if, if they do have that exposure. 
So when you're dealing with assistive devices and techniques, um, you're going to have to assess a fitting sometimes um, with the audiologist or specialist. And then when you get them in the hospital setting, you need to make sure that um, you are very tender and careful. These things are easy to break. Um, some of these have little filaments that act as uh, vib vibrational uh, receptors. So they literally stick, ah, dang it, $1.50. They stick into the inner ear itself. And by doing that, if you touch it the wrong way, it pops off and you break it and you don't mean to. Um, but it provides amplification. It gives you sound lateralization and you understand and discriminate speech. So it's a big deal that you have these. Um, you have to have someone who is going to wear them. I don't know why you would even bother spending a thousand, two thousand, sometimes five thousand dollars on something to improve your hearing and you would rather be deaf and put them in a case. Um, usually this happens in gentlemen. If you guys find the answer why, please let me know because I am dying to know because I've never understood that whatsoever. I want to be able to hear. If someone's coming from behind me, I want to be able to be ready to fight back. Like that's just me. That's just my deal in the world. I don't see why people wouldn't want to feel the same way. So um, make sure that we are doing everything that we can to encourage them to put these on so that they can communicate because it'll make you depressed if you're not able to communicate with other people. I mean, it's just I mean, it's a proven fact. So we want to do everything we can to help them out. All right, here are the types of hearing aids. Um, the one to the far right is the one that usually has that filament I'm talking about. It's usually clear and then it has a ball at the very end of it and that's one you really need to be careful for. The first three aren't that big of a deal um, because there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do to do it wrong. Um, and that's all I got for this slide. So when you're using these hearing aids, you really, really want to make sure that you're in a quiet environment when you start it because you have to titrate this thing, right? We got to crank it up, we got to tune it down, we got to make sure it's it's good enough, it's not blasting in our ear, but it's not quiet as a church mouse. So the last thing you want is a bunch of barking dogs and a holiday party going on around you, right? Like keep the family away until you get adjusted to this because there is an adjustment process. Um, progress to the outside, then go to public places so you can see if you got to tweak it again. Um, a lot of these have noise counseling on it, um, and a lot of them don't. So it's a lot of tweaking until they get used to it. And that's probably one of the reasons why, now that I think about it, they don't want to necessarily deal with it because they're in a new environment and it's just too much for them to deal with when they're feeling sick. Maybe that's the answer. Um, you want to store them in a cool, dry place. You want to remove the battery. You want to change the battery appropriately because if these batteries explode and the acid comes out of it, then it's going to mess with your hardware. Um, clean them weekly or at night because you're going to get oozy, ooky gooky things on them. So you want to keep them nice and tidy. And that's all I got for this slide. Okay, so we're talking about assistive devices and techniques. Um, we have these implantable devices or semi implantable. So the one that's fully implantable picks up and transmits vibrations and amplifies sound. Um, so does the other. Uh, but it actually has better functionality. Um, I had a friend who had a cochlear implant, and he was amazing. So one day we were out at the football field, and he goes, because I, I used to um, uh, be a, a children's minister. So um, I had him on one end of the football field because there was a school there and a football field. And he said, hey, Molly, real quick. And I said, yeah, what's up? He goes, walk to the other side of the football field. And I said, why would I do that? And he goes, because I want you to whisper something to me. And I'm like, well, what am I whispering to you? He goes, I don't know, figure it out. He'd had this thing maybe two weeks. And about this tone I'm giving right here at 100 yards away, I you know, gave him a sequence of numbers. And I came back and I said, what did I just tell you? And he literally gave me, a, oh, man, this two bucks. Give me a high five. And on his hand, he wrote what I had told him. And he was trying to show me, but I high-fived him because, again, I don't get social cues. <laughs> but it was amazing to me that you could hear 100 yards out this volume, 100 yards. I mean, that's, that's incredibly impressive. That's why I'm so excited about this piece. And this is a partially implantable. So you have the box behind the ear, which is like a computer chip, which is why I think you sound bionic because you are bionic, and that's amazing, um, versus the fully implantable, which doesn't have – um, that that piece and part right there some people it really bothers them um, I don't care I mean who wouldn't want to hear it 100 yards away um, at a very very low tone that's fantastic I'd do whatever to be able to hear like that because you'd be amazed at what you figured out in the world right 
So that's all I have for these. Just remember um, the partially implantable is removable. You take the box off, you put the box on, you charge it, the whole nine. And then the fully implantable, you don't even have to mess with it. It's just there. So this slide was on our review, I think. Um, lip reading is a big deal for people who have hearing problems. We live by it. That's how we function as we're waiting for our acuity to come back. If we're some people that have acuity that comes back. The visual cues that you make on your speech, I understand that's half of your speech in my brain. So I'm trying to, because I can't hear you when it happens, I'm trying to read your lips and understand your facial movement. And luckily I've had cognitive behavioral therapy, so I know what goes with what now versus me not knowing anything. Um, so I will be able to look at you and if you are thinking about something else other than what we're talking about, I might think that you might be mad at me because if you're thinking about something else in, in your subconscious brain, you're relaxed. But if you have the thinking face that I have, which usually comes with three initials and the first one's R and the last one's F and I'm not going to go ahead and say it, but you get the gist. If I'm lost in thought um, and I'm also connecting with somebody from through verbal speech, you will think I'm angry if you can't hear. Um, because I've heard that, you know, I've had people literally, ah, dang it, 250. I've had someone come up and go, hey, Molly, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. Why? What's up? Well, you're quiet. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm naturally quiet. I don't like to talk. It takes all of my energy just to talk and communicate with the outside world. You don't understand. I, I, if, if I'm not talking about school or I'm not talking to a student, I'm not talking at all. Like, that's just what I do. And there's one side that you guys see and it's bubbly and it's happy and it's loud and it's proud. And that's fantastic because I want to influence you and encourage you to be free and be whoever that is that you want to be um, and to own it and be happy with it. But then when I get home, as much as I love you guys, because I do, I love you so much, I get so tired that I just conk out and I, I just collapse and sleep um, because it just takes that much energy off of me to give you the energy that you guys deserve. So keep that in mind when you're talking to somebody who can't hear what you're saying because they will absolutely perceive that as something terrible if you're not doing an attitude check. So make sure you're keeping up with that, okay? So again, we have sign language for those who have profound impairments. It's not universal. We considered ASL, um, the United States uh, and Canada uh, speaking version. England's got a different one. Australia. They use their own set, but they also use a derivative of ASL as well, and it just kind of it, it changes as you go along. Um, so just make sure that you're getting the interpreter services like Marty. Um, I would never use a family member unless it was a mother, and even then you got to be worried about it because sometimes they have Munchausen's by proxy. So you really just, for legal reasons, need to get with the Marty system, and at the last-ditch effort, what we do sometimes is we see if anyone does speak ASL, um, or speak ASL. If anyone signs, der, um, if anyone signs, because sometimes you'll get a nurse that can. Um, I know that we had a nurse at the last facility I was at who um, spoke Lebanese and I needed someone to speak Lebanese and I didn't have anyone to speak Lebanese that day. I also had another nurse that was Ukrainian. And if you know anything of, about the Ukrainian and Russian culture, they are basically touching each other, but their language sometimes is completely different. And it's not like North and South different. It's like North and Mississippi Creole different. Um, it's that much different. So th they communicate a little bit, but it doesn't translate a wholeheartedly. So you really need someone who speaks, you know, Ukrainian and not Russian. They will ask you if you speak Russian as a secondary language. And if you're hardcore from the Ukraine and you were born and raised in the Ukraine and you've just immigrated to the U.S. recently because of the, the conflict that's going on there. Hey, it's a war. I'm going to go ahead and say it. the war that's going over there. They only speak Ukrainian. They are adamant about only speaking Ukrainian. And duh, why wouldn't they? You've heard what's going on over there. I get it. So you have to have someone who is able to interpret and speak that derivative of language. Um, and I just happen to have a really great melting pot of nurses um, that speak Lebanese and Ukrainian. So I called them and those were legal moves because I did have to check. So keep that in mind if you have you know, something that you're not going to necessarily have full access to. Sorry, I mean the snack. Okay, so with the vestibular cochlear nerve implant, like I said, this thing is bomb to me. I love it. I think it's great. Um, it's for severe to profound neurosensory loss in one or both ears. It bypasses 
or misses portions of the ear directly uh, directly innervating cra cranial nerve eight bottom line so you have to have that co cochlear nerve vestibular cochlear damage in order to get the okay to get the insurance on this because this device costs the costs sorry i'm literally eating a cheese stick ah three dollars dang it someone's gonna be really excited about this when they when they go through it and i don't know who it's gonna be but the first one that gets me like i said five names in the pot we're already at three bucks and we still got mm, five more slides to go and then a whole thing on vision so this might get a little hairy for me but whatever it's fair so watch this because these things, um, they can cost the upwards of 20, 30, sometimes 35, 40 thousand dollars, depending on what your copay is. So you got to make sure that they meet criteria. And some people will put these things in and they don't meet criteria and then you get stuck with the bill. You have great hearing and that's totally worth it, in my opinion, but not to people who can't afford to, you know, pay for a bionic ear when they really need to pay for a car. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, here she is. Isn't it pretty? Anyways, um, there's a, a sound processing center um, that works internally. It goes in between your skull and, you know, the surface tissue of your scalp. Um, then the external piece is like a magnet, and then you just pop it on and pop it off as it goes. There's a sound processor. Um, it's got Bluetooth wireless on it. Um, there's talk of them actually upgrading it um, to include other items, like you can play music with it. Um, you can activate your iPod to it because it has Bluetooth service. I mean, the the potential for this is kind of dangerous in a great way. Could you imagine what we could do if we if we had these for our infantry members, right? How effective that would that be uh, if we use this with people who work behind the green door, um, who uh, do you know MI stuff, right? Like. I think these would, this is going to, if this goes well and continuously goes well, once this is uh, no longer a patent pending issue and once it's free reign, um, we're going to start using this, I'm pretty sure, fairly, uh, people are going to have these options. And this reminds me of people who are microchipped in their wrist so that they can pay for things and so that they can access doors so they don't have to open their key doors. Like the, people are piloting that and have been for about five, eight, five to eight years now. Um, so this might also revolutionize what that looks like as well, which could also be a very dangerous thing. But for the purposes of just being able to hear, this is the Rolls Royce. This is the Bugatti of hearing devices. And you have sharper hearing with this than you have ever imagined um, having hearing, which is, I think, a fantastic thing. So when you have... Um, near deafness or deafness you have to have assistive devices like flashing alert systems infrared systems for tv and sound um, you have to have special text um, i remember i had a friend who was deaf in high school um, because i went to um, a, a school for people who were disabled to be fair um, when i started high school at 14. so when I, when I went there, I had a deaf friend and we liked to talk on the phone, but obviously he didn't, he didn't hear. So what we had to do was a weird service. And it was back in the day where you had to, you know, pick up your phone that's attached to a cord, which I know a lot of you don't know what that's like, that was, you know, secured to the wall. And then you would call the, um, the communication service. And what they would do is I would speak to the representative, which was really weird at 14, but hey, it was cool, it was whatever. Um, I would say something like, hey, how are you doing? What's up? You know, I'm throwing a little swag on it or whatever. And then um, they would send it to their pager, <laughs> which you probably don't know what that is either. And then they would send the message over via pager and then they would page back and then they would speak to me. Um, and it's a little weird, but, you know, these are the things that we have for assistive devices. And nowadays that's gotten much better. Um, nowadays, I don't know if you know this, we actually have a language service that's an app. So what I do is I speak and there's a little guy that's like a emoji guy and he signs what I want to say. So I'll hold it up to the patient or I'll give the phone to the patient and I'll be within earshot and I'll say, Hey, how are you doing? I'm your nurse today. And this little device and this, this, uh, avatar, um, starts to do perfect American sign language to speak to the patient. 
um, which I think is phenomenal. And then they just text. And then from them texting, they it's able to speak and track it. So I think it's quite phenomenal, the things that we have and the things that we're still working on. Um, we also have specially trained dogs um, to help out if they are, you know, in the middle of the road and the dogs see something and they can't because it's behind them and they can't hear it. Or if someone's trying to come up and attack them, right, which is a big deal. Um, so, yeah, those those are things to consider as well. I don't think you're going to see anything on your any of your exams regarding this specifically, um, but just for the sake of, you know, and I think it's important. So, again, as you get older, your vision gets poor, right, which is, makes it harder to read lips. So as you get older, you're going to have more hearing problems and you're going to have more communication problems related to the fact that you can't recognize the words that are coming out of somebody's mouth because you can't see them. And that's all the slide says. So that's all I got. Okay, presbycusis caused by degeneration of the inner ear. That's a pretty, pretty great term. I would remember that. Um, noise exposure is a common factor. Uh, prognosis could be great, could be not so great. Just depends on how long it's been going on and it depends on how far it's gotten into the system. Um, hearing device it helps amplify things. Of course, you got audiologic rehabilitation, uh, but it's expensive, right? And it looks unsightly sometimes. Um, sometimes you don't know you have it. You don't even think of it because you don't really spend a lot of time with other people. You just spend a lot of time with your spouse, right? And you know your spouse inside and out, or at least you should. So you can differentiate what they're saying fairly easily. And then you go out into the community and you're like, or what? What's going on? Um, so make sure that you understand that so that you can slow down the level of your influx in speech so that um, they can see it or maybe you need to exaggerate it a little more so that they can understand those consonants you're trying to um, articulate. So what are some verbal aids we can use? Well, we can use simple sentences. Um, we can write names uh, for difficult words, right? Um, we don't want to shout. We want to use a normal tone. We want to deepen our voice if we can. We want to have a normal volume. We want to have a normal pace. We want to make sure we're enunciating. We don't want to exaggerate. We want to enunciate. Big difference. Um, we never, sorry, I hear a child screaming from her nap, so it looks like Luckily, we're on our last slide, so this is good. Um, you want to speak in a normal, direct voice. You want to avoid anything in between the two of you so that they can see you clearly. You don't want to have a distracting environment where they can't focus on what you're saying. Now, it's funny that we just mentioned that we need to have a, a normal tone. We don't want to um, yell and that we want to keep a baseline expression and we don't want to have too many hand movements, all of the things. Because I do recall somewhere in our review where we talked specifically about those items, how you're supposed to talk in a normal tone using a normal voice that is not screaming or shouting. I, I believe that's a specific um, in your review. So that's all you got for this.